Well, welcome again to this um, fourth lecture in the Darwin College Lecture Series on the theme of um, beauty. Uh, last week's lecture began with um, uh, Pythagoras' efforts to uh, find the mathematical basis of, har of musical harmony. And this week we're considering the beauty of music. Our title is The, uh, the Sound of Beauty. And our speaker is uh, Elizabeth Eva Leach, who's a historical musicologist at Oxford University. She's an expert on the medieval roots of Western music. She's written about the influences of birdsong and the influences of poetry. Um, this year, she's publishing a study of um, Guillaume de Machaut, whose music and poetry must have given a very rare glimpse of beauty in the otherwise I imagine, ghastly 14th century. With her unique uh, historical perspective, it's a great pleasure to introduce Elizabeth Eva Leach. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me to give this talk today. I'm going to start with the idea that the sound of beauty is dangerous. In the late 1990s, among the many horrors perpetrated by the Taliban regime in Afghanistan was a ban on, quote, equipment that produces the joy of music. And they also banned, and note the link here, because it will crop up in, in the talk later, they banned anything that propagates sex and is full of music. We might dismiss this kind of ban as extremist, specifically linked to a very un-European religious fundamentalism but worries about the joy of music and the idea that it might be linked to sexual impropriety are actually rather central to the Western European tradition. So in order to hold up a mirror to modern day reactions to the sounds of beauty, I'm gonna start with a much older story. On his way back from the Trojan War, Odysseus was able to hear one of the most famous sounds of beauty in literature, the song of the sirens. But unlike the unfortunate sailors who'd gone before him, cunning Odysseus was prepared Earlier in the story, Odysseus had been given a detailed warning about the trials to come. First, he is told, you will come to the sirens, who beguile all mortals, any who comes their way. Whoso draws near in ignorance and hears the sounds of the sirens, him, wife, and innocent children shall not meet on his returning home, nor shall they have joy of him. But the sirens beguile him with clear voice song, sitting in their meadow but all about is a great heap of the bones of rotting men and their hides waste away around them. So make speed past them and knead honey-sweet wax and smear it over your comrades' ears, lest any of them should hear. But if you yourself wish to hear, let them bind you in the swift ship, hand and foot, upright at the foot of the mast, and let cords be attached to you so that you may hear the two sirens voice with pleasure. But if you beseech your comrades and bid them release you, let them bind you then with all the more bonds. So the wise Odysseus, famed for his cunning, obeys these instructions to the letter and gets to hear the song of the sirens in safety. And here we have a representation of that. Um, there's not just two of them on this picture. Here's, here's a picture slightly older. <laughs> um, um, what, Unlike every traveler who'd gone before, Odysseus experiences the sound of irresistibly enticing beauty and lives to tell the tale. And what interests me about this tale is the link between the beauty of a song and its ability to overcome reason, to enchant, to beguile, its power to lead men, and I'll get back to the men and women thing in a minute, its power to lead men astray and ultimately to their deaths. This is a beauty that will kill the unwary and represents one side of the coin of music's ethical value. In today's talk, I want to explore both negative and positive understandings of the beauty of sound from antiquity to the present, with a focus in particular on the later Middle Ages, which was the point when antique views of mu music were synthesized with Christian morality in a way that has pretty much remained current in the West ever since. What will emerge is a history of varied judgments of music, arguments over the ethics of music's power, and arguments over music's place in defining what individual humanity is. But first, if we dare, let's spend a bit longer with the sirens. Reading book 12 of the Odyssey might make us curious as to what the siren's song is actually like, what makes it so compellingly beautiful, 
But of course, the power of the song is partly in the fact that, except for Odysseus, no one, not even the narrator of the Odyssey, has heard it and lived to tell the tale. If the narrator of the Odyssey, and for convenience, let's call him Homer, had heard it, he wouldn't have been around to write the poem. And if it could be replicated directly, any audience of Homer's poem, itself a kind of song, would be running the same death, a risk of death, as Mariner's. So effectively, the Odyssey's second-hand reporting of this episode acts as the wax in our ears. The text simply says that the song is clear, which might be a reflection just of how comprehensible the words of the sirens are. Because the siren's song is not only beautiful music, but beautiful music with words, i.e. song. And we are told what the words of the song are. Come hither, much praised Odysseus, great glory of the Achaeans. Draw up your ship so that you may hear the voice of us too. For no one yet has passed this way in his black ship before hearing the honeyed voice from our mouths, but he goes home, having rejoiced and knowing more. For we know all the things that in broad Troy the Argives and Trojans endured by the will of the gods. Now, classicists, and I'm not a classicist, but classicists att attest to how euphonious these lines are in the original Greek and how close to the Iliad in diction. The siren's song flatteringly tempts Odysseus with the retelling of the story of his own heroic role in the Iliad. But if the man is to leave Troy behind, he has to leave it behind in song, as well as merely traveling away from it by boat. So here's a summary of the sirens of the Odyssey. Beautiful sound here causes the individual su subject, Odysseus, to confront a conflict between desire and discipline. Only by being ready for the performance, by setting up a situation of self-control that is actually beyond his self-control, can Odysseus allow himself safely to experience what it feels like to lose control, to be free of oneself. Beautiful music, beautiful sound, defeats reason, removes self-control, and is therefore mortally dangerous. Only by binding oneself tightly to an upright mast and surrounding oneself by those deaf to music's pleasures can one survive the jeopardy that beautiful sound represents. So my argument today is that throughout music history, um, music theory and musical practice have attempted in, in various ways, not always with great success, to provide the ropes that might allow the human subject to wallow in music's beauty while avoiding its dangers. But before we get on to that, I should introduce you some, to some other uh, sirens, some rather different sirens. The sirens of the Odyssey are not the only sirens in antiquity. At the end of Plato's Republic, Socrates says that he will tell a story. But, Socrates says, the story is specifically not one of the tales that Odysseus tells Alcinous, tales which occupy much of the Odyssey and include the story of the sirens. Although Socrates says he is actually going to tell the story of a hero, just not Odysseus. Socrates instead tells the story of Air, a slain warrior who returns to life on his funeral pyre with his own stories of the afterlife that he's briefly inhabited. This afterlife involves a trip to the celestial spheres, which are arranged in circles on a giant spindle. And, he says, on the upper surface of each circle is a siren who goes round with the spindle, with them, hymning a single note or tone. The eight together form one harmony. Now here the siren's song is similarly beautiful to the sirens uh, in the Odyssey, but it's not dangerous. Instead, it's associated with the other side of death, the perfect afterlife in which it represents the harmony of the spheres. Now the harmony of the spheres in the classical world is about the harmonious nature of the movements and proportions between the heavenly bodies in the universe. The sirens that sing this heavenly harmony are representative not of the enchanting power of an irrationality that leads to a loss of self-control, but of a divine rationality that orders the universe. And it's worth stressing that this is much more than just a metaphor. When, in the sixth century, Boethius transmitted much classical learning about musical tuning and harmonics to the post-classical world, he divided music into three kinds. First, instrumental music, in which he included vocal music. Uh, that's the music that, that humans make. Second, 
he said, was human music. And that's not the music that humans make, but the music, the proportions of which humans are made up, essentially the harmony of soul and body. And the third was celestial music, the music of the spheres. Now, only the first of these three kinds, instrumental music, makes any kind of sound in the sublunary world, in the world here below. So music wasn't, for the Greeks or for the medievals, uh, defined by sound, but rather was a feature of rational proportion, which could be, but didn't have to be, manifested sonically. In placing the sirens in charge of the ultimate expression of this rationality, the music of the spheres, Plato effectively rescues their song from being irrational and fatal, as it is in the Odyssey, and elevates it to a divine harmony, although one that's not audible to those people still living on Earth. The harmony of the spheres is at the opposite ethical pole from the song of the sirens in the Odyssey, but the two songs share the features of being irresistibly beautiful. But this beauty is, it seems, only good after death. In the sublunary world of the living, it's deadly. And this is why Boethius' music treatise attempts to offer a pedagogical understanding of musical tuning, the science of harmonics, which will ensure that what he calls instrumental music, the music that humans make, whether with the artificial instruments that they blow or pluck, or with the natural instruments of their voices, uh, approaches the moral good of the music of the spheres, rather than being like the song of the sirens of the sea. Inspired by the greater detail given about the harmony of the spheres in Plato's other work, uh, one of his other works, the Timaeus, um, and other classical works deriving from it, several music theorists of the Middle Ages even assigned notes of the scale uh, to the planets in the heavens, mapping the interval series that came in between them in diagrammatic form. And you can see a, a representation of that. I'm afraid this is not very clear. Um, but you'll see at the bottom, uh, we have the word terra. Above that, Luna, the moon, then Mercury, then Venus. And in between the little um, triangles, uh, we have the word tonus, semitonus, and so on. So there's a tone in between the Earth and the moon, and a, t a semitone in between the moon and Mercury. So this was, this was serious for uh, people in the Middle Ages. And it's vital, as far as those who read Boethius' music treatise understood it, that human, making, human music making be irreproachable and model itself on the harmony of the spheres. In Neoplatonic thought, music's cosmic proportions, made to sound on Earth, speak to the proportions in the human soul and can retune it. If music that is heard retunes the soul and the soul controls human behavior, the potential of musicians uh, the potential power of musicians is enormous and must therefore be wielded with knowledge and enjoyment and judgment. Both his music treaties actually influenced hundreds of years of music theory, and the idea of cosmic harmony penetrated deep into the Western uh, idea of what uh, music should be as a way of arguing against the dangers of the song of the sirens of the sea and in favor instead of music's divine rationality. It represents one of these uh, ropes by which uh, we can be bound to the mast and, and, and able to enjoy music's beauty without it giving us trouble. Given their strong classical legacy, early, classic, uh, early Christian writers both appreciated the power of beautiful sound over the soul and worried about this power's ability to enchant the listener, making him passive and distracted by the beauty of sound. And they saw sound as a perilously seductive, feminine form of beauty. And I'll come on to this a bit more in a moment. In his Confessions, written at the very end um, of the fourth century, Augustine, St. Augustine, sums this up rather neatly in two rather contrasting passages. First of all, he thanks God that he's now cured of his former slavish devotion to the sound of beauty and is focused instead properly on the divine words that are being sung. He says, The delights of the ear drew and held me much more powerfully, but thou didst unbind and liberate me. He's, he's addressing God. In those melodies which thy words inspire, when sung with a sweet and trained voice, I still find repose yet not so as to cling to them, but always so as to be able to free myself as I wish. And you can see it's sort of protesting a bit too much. But it's because of the words, uh, the words which are their life that they gain entry into me, sort of honest, um, and strive for a place of proper honor in my heart, and I can hardly assign them a fitting one. 
So he's really going out of his way to sort of stress that it's the words, not the music, that's attracting him. Unfortunately, he then goes straight on to admit that sometimes I seem to myself to give them, the melodies, more respect than is fitting when I see that our minds are more devoutly and earnestly inflamed in piety by the holy words when they are sung than when they are not. And I recognize that all the diverse affections of our spirits have their appropriate measures in voice and song to which they are stimulated by I know not what secret correlation. But the pleasures of my flesh to which the mind ought never to be surrendered, nor by them enervated, often beguile me while physical sense does not attend on reason to follow her patiently. But once having gained entry to help the reason, it strives to run on before her and be her leader. Thus, in these things, I sin unknowingly, but come to know it afterward. So, led by his senses, running ahead of his reason, Augustine worries that the pleasure that he takes in hearing liturgical singing in church is a sin of the flesh, a couple of chapters earlier in the Confessions, Augustine had already talked about the erotic pull of his past sexual life before he converted to Christianity as being something that Christian continents had told him to stop his ears against. This stopping of the ears, like the reference to being in the bondage of beautiful sound, seems to be an indirect reference to the story of the sirens itself and reveals that sexual sin and sinful kinds of listening are deeply connected for Augustine. And just as there was one rule for Odysseus, uh, who got to hear the sirens, and another for his crew, who had their ears filled with wax, Augustine, too, recognizes a hierarchy that makes music appropriate for some people, but not for others, although his hierarchy is actually the other way around compared to that in the Odyssey. So having admitted that he sometimes desires the over-extreme austerity of completely banning singing in the church, Augustine remembers the tears that it caused him to weep when he found his faith originally. So he was sort of almost converted through the beauty of the song of the church. And he's forced to admit that in terms of its power to convert, singing is useful. So that by the delights of the ear, the weaker minds may be stimulated to a devotional mood. Yet when it happens that I am more moved by the singing than by what is sung, I confess myself to have sinned wickedly, and then I would rather not have heard the singing. Augustine stresses that reason must lead the senses, not the other way round, and makes it clear that reason lies in the words of what the chant is saying, while the melody appeals to the senses. The idea that music might only be acceptable because it's a vehicle for verbal truths contained in the text is of a piece with the suspicion that early church authorities had for music that was untexted and which was typically used for dancing. In such cases, the lack of a text whose higher and rational truths might excuse the pleasure taken by the hearers of the melody was compounded by the purpose of wordless music, which was designed to animate bodies through dancing, a social, physical, and sensual practice that offered sinful opportunities for participants and spectators alike. Now, elsewhere in his writings, Augustine does actually talk much more positively about the musical element of singing when he talks about something he calls the jubilus, by which he seems to mean the melisma on the final syllable of the chant, setting the words alleluia. Now, a melisma um, is it's, it's typically many notes which simply prolong a single syllable, a single sound uh, in the text. And here it's the final syllable of alleluia, ha, 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 ha. Um, as it were. Um, now, the Alleluia as a, whole, as a whole, of course, is not entirely without text. It has the word Alleluia. But the long melisma at the end is so much an extension of that single final syllable um, that rather than conveying the sense of the text anymore, it instead serves to give a space, uh, to give expression to a sort of purer emotion. And what Augustine says about it is, one who jubilates does not speak words, but is, it is rather a sort of sound of joy without words, for the voice of the soul is poured out in joy, showing as much as it is able the feeling without comprehending the sense. A man joying in his exhortation from certain unspeakable and incomprehensible words bursts forth in a certain voice of exhortations without words, so that uh, it seems he does indeed rejoice with his own voice, but as if, because filled with too much joy, he cannot put it into words that in which he delights." Now, I'm going to play you the, an example of an alleluia. Um, and what I'll do is I'll just raise my hand when they get to the melisma on the yard, just so it's clear where that is. Uh, and I want you really just to imagine yourselves 
uh, singing it. This is a, a performance. a serious form of joy, but nevertheless, it's a sort of a, a rhapsodic kind of uh, serious joy in that uh, final syllable. Um, the sound of the heart rejoicing without words, or just to this final syllable, is acceptable to Augustine not only because it rejoices in the praise of God, but also because Augustine is speaking about the performer's perspective. So what commentators seem not to have noticed here is that Augustine is happy to accept the musical expression of joy as a performer because it's acceptable that one can know the intention because one is generating the sound. I intend to transmit joy, I sing joyfully. But when one is merely a passive listener, as in his earlier comments, the effect is altogether different. Now the problem is that rarely is there a singer without a listener. And even when everyone present is singing, they are all also listening. So the danger of being charmed by one's own voice seems to remain for Augustine as a troublingly autoerotic possibility. Although not if you've heard me sing, I have to say. <laughs> for those like Augustine who saw the value and beauty in music but worried about its potential to distract from the contemplation of moral good, it was necessary to emphasize the rational and ethical aspects of music. Um, in his music theory treatise, um, which I've already mentioned, Boethius summarizes Plato's strictures in the Republic when he defines uh, music of the highest character as temperate, simple, and masculine, rather than effeminate, violet, violent, or wild, or sort of animal-like, and fickle. Now, these binaries are actually repeated by, lots, by hundreds of years' worth of, of uh, later music theorists. In terms of medieval rhetorical tropes, which insisted that gender categories were biologically determined and immutable, this meant de-emphasizing the passive appreciation of music's beauty as something feminine, seductive, de-rationalizing and effeminizing, in favor of instead an active engagement with music's rationality as something masculine, numerical, quantifiable, and part of the active mental engagement of a performer. This was especially the case in the Christian Middle Ages, when the sung liturgy of the church was so central to the everyday praise of God. Banning music in church was just not an option. To ensure it was the right kind of music, though, the teaching and study of music, the discipline of musica, developed a specific pedagogy in which the very definition of what was and what was not music was based on music's expression of a rationality that belongs only to humans and not to other animals. Most typically, in music theoretical and pedagogical contexts, this rationality expresses itself in an ability to understand the mathematical ratios that underlie the correct tunings of the musical intervals within the range of notes used in liturgical chant. However, for most writers of this period, even tuned sounds like that, whose intervals exhibited those sorts of ratios, only merit the status of music when they are both produced and heard by an intellectually engaged rational animal, i.e. by a human. And again, this thinking is carried over from earlier antique traditions of, music, uh, of understanding music. Um, even before he converted to Christianity, um, the classically trained Augustine started writing a music treatise cast in the form of a dialogue between a master and a pupil. In stressing to the pupil that musica is a science, that is, something involving knowledge, the master uses the example of the song of the nightingale. And, and here is a representation of the dialogue. The master says, tell me then whether the nightingale seems to make musical intervals with its voice well in the spring of the year. For its song is both harmonious and sweet, and unless I'm much mistaken, it fits the season. And the pupil goes, hmm, it seems quite so. <laughs> Students in these days were, were very happy to agree. Uh, with tutors. Uh, 
He says, but it isn't trained in the liberal discipline, is it? And he says, no. <laughs> and he says, you see then, the noun science is indispensable to the definition. I see it clearly. <laughs> now then, <laughs> tell me then, don't they all seem to be a, a, a kind with the nightingale, all those which sing under the guidance of a certain sense, that is, do it harmoniously and sweetly, although if they were questioned about these number or intervals of high and low notes, they could not apply. I think they're very much alike. Again, the, the student agrees. And what's more, says the master, aren't those who like to listen to them without this science to be compared to beasts? For we see elephants, bears, and many other kinds of beasts are moved by singing, and birds themselves are charmed by their own voices. For with no further proper purpose, they would not do this with such effort without some pleasure. Okay. <laughs> so the pupil agrees that the voice of the nightingale sounds like music, but when it is pointed out to him that the bird is not trained in musica, the liberal discipline of music which makes music the rational property of humans, he admits that bird song can't really be considered music in that sense. The master then extrapolates to liken the nightingale's lovely but irrational non-music to the playing of human performers guided only by a certain sense, but lacking the understanding of what they're doing. And he goes further. People who like to listen to such non-music without themselves understanding the rationality or the science behind uh, musica can be compared to elephants and bears and many other kinds of beasts that are moved by singing. So the mere enjoyment of beautiful sound doesn't make the listener human, and nor does it make that sound music, which is seen as being, by definition, something human. Now, Augustine actually outlines many of the issues that extend throughout the Middle Ages. He demands that even if the song sounds sweet and well-measured, the musicians must know what they're doing or they're no better than animals. And listeners who take pleasure in music by musicians who don't know what they're doing are also no better than beasts. That which makes music a science or an art is that which separates it from nature and from the natural voices of birds and other animals which just seem to sing. The performer of music, then, is under an obligation not just to make musical sounds, but to understand them as musica, that is, as proportions that are rational. And the listener is also under an obligation to understand sounds in this way, whether or not their performing agent does so. Whether that performer is a bird or an unthinking human, by listening actively, the medieval hearer, who can tell whether or not the beautiful sound is music or not, can avoid being reduced to a similarly bestial status. The problem for music pedagogy, however, was that it was reliant on models taking from, taken from the teaching of language. Um, it's relatively easy to differentiate language from non-linguistic utterance because language conveys semantic content with its sound, or as uh, here on this slide, as medieval grammarians said, its vox, the word star, has a verbum. It signifies that, not necessarily that kind of star, but any kind of star. The rational context, content of language is thus semantic, binding it tightly to human agents wanting to communicate sensible information. But the rational component of music is its ratios. The vox are tuned musical sounds, uh, which is something that species other than humans seem to use to communicate in a distinctly non-linguistic manner. So music's ontology couldn't be pinned down using grammatical models. Music like Intervals could be imitated by birds or by untrained singers with a good ear so that a listener could never be sure that the seemingly rational sound being heard was not something dangerously irrational. Given that medieval authorities viewed women as less rational than men, and cast your minds back to the slide of Boethius talking about the, the music of the highest character is masculine and that that isn't is feminine, we might now begin to appreciate why in the earliest instantiations Sirens are shown, shown as hybrids of women and birds. And this is from a, a medieval vestry. Many later clerical writers took their cue from Augustine's ambivalence about listening to music and sought to imp impose strictures on what they viewed as feminine and feminizing excess in performance. The 12th century writer John of Salisbury, for example, criticizes those singing in church services for what he identifies as the lightness and dissolution of dainty voices designed to achieve vain glory in the feminine manner. He's talking about a load of 12th century monks. <laughs> Thou wouldst think, John continues, that these were the most delicious songs of very pleasing sirens, not of men, 
And that was marvel at the lightness of voice, which cannot be compared in all their measures and pleasing melodies to those of the nightingale or parrot or any more, other more clear-sounding bird that might be found. So these male singers' effeminacy and effeminizing powers, because they make their listeners into women as well, are stronger and all the more worrisome on account of their virtuosity. John describes the singers as more eloquent than two natural avian practitioners, but says that their sounds would make listeners mistake them for sirens, these women-bird hybrids, rather than men. Rationality is the defining feature uh, of not only the human soul, but specifically of both masculinity and musica, differentiating men both from the beasts, including birds, and from women. According to John of Salisbury, the beautiful sound of accomplished singers uh, takes the singers and potentially their passive listeners away from their humanity and away from their masculinity, making them into effeminate, monstrous, and unnatural things. Sirens, and there's the same picture a little larger in color, appear in medieval bestries, where, like all bestry animals, they are explained as encoding a moral message. All the medieval moralizations of the sirens mention their beautiful singing and the danger that it poses, explaining it in terms of various worldly blandishments, money, rich food, illegitimate sex, and other sensory excesses. The illustrations typically, as here, depict three sirens as a visual embodiment of Boethius's Musica Instrumentalis, that's sounding music, uh, instrumental music. One plucks a stringed instrument, one plays uh, an instrument through blowing, and the third sings. And you can see here on this one below, a man is actually pulled in two by this beautiful music. And he's really pulled in two between uh, a figure who's been shot by Cupid's arrow, signaling the sort of um, lust and, and sensory excess, and a figure that looks much more uh, Christ-like, has a, a cowl on his head, and has been got in the side with a spear. Um, here's another picture of some sirens who've actually got some clothes on, uh, which did also happen. Um, <laughs> and sirens just served as a, a, a reminder that um, beautiful music can be dangerous. You can see here that Odysseus has been cut away from this particular manuscript page. Uh, we don't know what he would have looked at like, but you can see in the boat all the sailors uh, uh, with their wax in their ears, unable to hear the sirens. Sometimes sirens turn up visually in churches, in, in medieval churches, sculpted on corbels or decorating the exterior masonry. And sometimes they're inked into books designed for use in church services. Reading these images requires a certain amount of decoding from the, from the viewer and poses questions of interpretation for us. And here's an example from uh, a late 13th century chant book. Uh, this is liturgical chant, um, possibly from England, uh, but now in a library in France. The credential formula that will connect the in secular secularum at the end of the chant back to the repeat of an earlier bit of the chant is being held up by a siren. What does this mean? Is it a warning or a joke? And it's perhaps significant that this occurs in the chants for the office of St. Cecilia, a woman whose link to music was very clear, but whose moral propriety, and especially her sexual continence, was even clearer. And the legend of St. Cecilia is simply that at, at her wedding, she was quite distressed to be getting married, and she sat apart singing psalms and uh, thereafter managed to keep her husband away from her bed and convert him to Christianity. The siren who supports part of St. Cecilia's office perhaps acts as a reminder of the ever-lurking presence of musical and moral impropriety in the context of the propriety of St. Cecilia herself. So both of music's ethical possibilities are plainly brought into view here in the hope, perhaps, that only one of them gets translated into sound. Outside the cloister, practitioners pursued slightly different methods of shoring up music's ethical goodness to enable the appreciation of beautiful sounds in despite of their detractors. Even dance music, melody with or without words for people to move their bodies to, had its apologists. Because it was not associated with the literate musicians of the cloister or court chapels, instrumental music was very rarely written down in the Middle Ages. One of the earliest discussions that we have um, is a music treatise written around 1300 by a Norman music theorist called Johannes de Grocaeo. 
Um, his discussion of the musical practices of late 13th century Paris describes a number of instrumental genres and dance forms. Um, and I'm afraid these come in in a sort of dance-like way to try and underscore this point. Um, Gorkea was influenced by the new Aristotelian philosophy of the late medieval universities, which had more, far more time um, than its uh, platonic forerunner to, to, for music and considered music to be an acceptable and ethical way to spend leisure. Um, Grokeo tries to validate much criticized secular musical forms and specifically claims that music diverts the young mind away from vice and away from sexual vice in particular. A genre that he calls the cantus coronatus has inherent bonitas, goodness, in it. Um, another genre, the cantus versualis, while not on the same level, should nevertheless be performed by the young lest they ever be found in idleness. And this is the same reason that the sung dance form called the stantipes uh, is used. He says uh, it represents, in the diversity of its rhymes and music, a level of difficulty that makes the minds of young men and girls dwell upon this and leads them away from depraved thoughts. And again, you sense he's sort of protesting rather too much. The nature of these depraved thoughts is actually uh, elucidated more explicitly when he comes to the genre that he calls the ductia, whose name he derives from the ex explanation that it leads the hearts, ducit corda is a sort of pun, that leads the hearts of young people away from vain thoughts and is said to have power against the passion which is called erotic love. Now, the ductia forms the instru instrumental accompaniment to the carole, a kind of dance in which men and women typically held hands in a circle or a line, and which, unsurprisingly, was frequently condemned by preachers in the later Middle Ages. Now, one sermon story designed to put people off these kinds of dances concerns a flute player who urged youths and maidens to dance to songs that inspired obscene and vulgar thoughts and behavior. As this flute player uh, tarried in the street at Vespers, he is struck dead and his arm is torn off by lightning. So this is a sermon example. Um, and then what happens is he's buried uh, in holy ground, um, but some devils turn up in the middle of the night and rob his grave and take him off to where he really belongs. Now, Grokea's writings counter this widespread religious opposition specifically to claim that such dance songs distract the young from precisely the same emotions that the mendicant preachers uh, of the 14th century maintain that they inspire. The most famous French poet and composer of the 14th century, Guillaume de Machaut, similarly stresses music's power to inspire joy, but of a very moral kind. He's shown here... Oh, here's, sorry, this is my earlier slide of the carol, people holding hands uh, in, a, in a row, in a, in a circle, and you can see um, the potential for impropriety to occur. The, the passing of letters, the passing of letters and the sort of general squeezing of fingers. Okay, here's Guillaume de Machaut. Hello, I'm Machaut. That's, this is him. Um, uh, on the right, being visited by Lady Nature and her children who are going to help him write his poetry. This is at the opening of the collected manuscripts of his work, um, a, a sort of prologue to the works as a whole. And in the prologue, the poet notes that spending time composing songs causes happiness, gaiety, joy, because no one intent on such things quarrels or argues or thinks of immorality, hate, foolishness, or scandal. Composition requires concentration on its own process and thus precludes these other thoughts. And he says, for when I am so minded as to write poetry or song, I wouldn't be able to think about anything except the sole purpose of making the proposed uh, poem or song. And if I were to think of something else, I would completely undo all my work. So here we have the idea that composition not only keeps despair at bay, but also like dancing to the ductia, avoids creating idle hands that the devil might find work for. And again, this moral aspect is available for those making music, whether through performance or composition, but in Macho's larger output, a mixture of narrative poems, lyrics, and music um, that was very influential, in fact, on Chaucer, uh, in Masha's larger output, uh, he propounds a, a, a similarly moral role for music for its listeners in the very distinctly non-pedagogical ambience of the court that he was writing for. His audience in the court are not necessarily trained musicians. They don't necessarily know about musica, this sort of rationalizing um, idea of, of uh, musical ratios. 
but they do know about moral, moral good, about beauty, and about different kinds of love and their good and bad effects. Machaut's poetry and music taught his lay audience about the importance of hope. As courtiers living in a mixed-sex community, their spiritual, existential, and practical needs were rather different from those of the regular monks who could happily see music as reflecting divine, neoplatonic harmonies. Instead, lay persons, essentially uh, later versions of those weaker spirits that Augustine had mentioned earlier, could, could use beautiful sound as a pleasurable form of ethical education. Practically, a beautiful song inscribes itself in memory with its text, making Machaut's short lyric items very memorable indeed. As Machaut's lyrics often summarize and epitomize ethical issues discussed at greater length in his narrative poems, Machaut's songs effectively served as a shortcut aid memoir for his ethical program, typically teaching virtues of um, generosity in giving, uh, courtly love, which is sort of very distinctly non-erotic, or non-physical, should I say. Most importantly, the pleasure of listening to a beautiful song can act as a stand-in for the pleasures that the song might describe. And so it performs a vicarious pleasure. In some cases, uh, we have 14th century songs which depict the pleasures of hunting, for example, replicating the sounds of the chase and giving a vicarious pleasure that takes up far less time than a real hunt would do. But courtly song much more typically celebrates, and therefore replaces, a more amorous chase the pursuit of ladies. Now, this song here, actually called Beauty, it's the first word there, Bialte, um, describes a peerless lady of refined sweetness with a body worthy of all praise, a soft face, a beautiful glance, and a joyful appearance. Unfortunately, for the lover who is singing this song, this beauty, like that of the sirens, is rather deadly. The lack of encouragement that he gets from her has brought him to the point of dying for love. But the music of the song has its own beauties, both auditory and, in this case, as you can see, visual. The notation is beautified by the use of red coloration, and it's no co coincidence that the words for red and beauty are actually related in many languages. Uh, the sound of the melisma um, where the red coloration is, uh, which terminates the three main sections of each stanza of this song, is a lovely musical sequence, and I'll, I'll point it out when I play it to you in a moment. It's replete with plangent dissonances and a wonderfully on undulating contour. So like the melisma of the jubilus of the Alleluia, which I played you earlier, this melisma, uh, which comes three times in each stanza, enables the singer to just sing and the listener to hear a sort of wordless kind of emotion. The listener to this song gains oral and visual representations of the lady's beauty and of the lover's pain, and the time spent listening to the song at once distracts and consoles. So I'm going to play this, and I will put my hand up when the melisma comes. It comes three times, and I'll try and remember to do it each time. I'm just going to play one stanza. The whole song actually has three. Beauty. 
musical items, especially songs, as objects of visual beauty as well as auditory beauty was taken to a high level in the court culture of the later 14th and 15th centuries. And here's an example of this kind of thing. These picture pieces were given as gifts on single sheets of parchment, particularly at New Year, when noblemen and women typically exchanged very costly items. And of course, parchment was not cheap. The last one here invites the recipient to see and hear the notes of the melodious harp. And essentially, this prettifying of song, turning it into a beautiful object, an artwork, a thing, serves to make the song a surrogate for the pleasure it describes, a safe and ethical surrogate that must be experienced socially, because you needed to have the musicians pr present, and in company, and gives a pleasure that isn't the pleasure that is sought by the desire for the lady, but another form of pleasure. And music in what we now call the later Middle Ages, uh, the 14th and 15th centuries, developed its own depiction of desire and fulfillment, or expectation and achievement, however you want to call this. I don't want to get too technical here, so I'm just going to uh, describe it as a succession of two sonorities, or chords, uh, in which the first sonority has an element of instability that makes it seem to lead to the second, more stable sonority. And uh, I've put this slide up, uh, help, hopefully, to give you something to focus on as I just give this description. Don't worry, this, this technical bit doesn't last too long. Um, the, the first sonority gives a sense of progression or movement uh, to, uh, going towards the second chord or, or sonority. Now, the 14th century seems to be the first time that the specifically harmonic element of music was able to figure expectation orally in this way. And for those of you who know a bit about how later music works, the repertoire, say, from Bach to Brahms, this idea will be familiar, as will the attendant idea of harmonic progression or harmonic movement. And this is more than a mere succession of sonorities, since progression here suggests a necessary connection that leads irresistibly from one moment to another. Now, late medieval music is, is not in keys. It's not actually in modes either, which are not really precursors to keys, whatever the popular history books tell you. Um, but like later, medieval, uh, like later med music, medieval music links chords together through the sharpening of what modern music theory might call a leading note. And this sharpened note, uh, which there is evidence that singers might have over-sharpened, destabilized the overall sonority making the first chord teeter into a near dissonance that led very strongly towards the note of resolution. This is this uh, very small step in one voice part that I've got there with the arrow. And the note causing the instability was, strictly speaking, outside the normal collection of pitches that medieval music theory described. In effect, it loosened the pedagogical rope binding music to the mast of the rational ship. And it did so while making the listener long for the next note of the song. Now, the adjustment of notes in this way was considered for reasons of beauty. That's what medieval music theorists say about it. And they distinguished it from pitch adjustments, which they made for what they called reasons of necessity, which was just a rule about making sure your octaves, fifths, and unisons were in tune. Um, so it was necessary to tune the perfectly consonant and highly stable intervals of octaves, fifths, and unisons, but inflecting the tuning of imperfectly consonant thirds and sixths was beautiful, and it was something that destabilized them further, creating the oral image of a temporal progression of sonorities, one resulting from the other. This was done by dividing the pitch spectrum into smaller intervals than those that had been used before, and by placing those intervals within the octave where they didn't ordinarily go, in terms of uh, pedagogy of musica, and this is a double transgression of the rational system that had been developed for chant so that it could reflect the rational music of the spheres. This was therefore very worldly music indeed. In the mid-14th century, the music theorist Johannes Boen notes that young men sick of the regular diatonic gamut, those are the notes used for chant, admit more notes than the ancients because they pursue mouths agape the wantonness of the song itself. And the word lascivia, from which we get the English lasciviousness, to describe this open mouth longing for new notes, already starts to admit an interpretation of this kind of listening as a potentially dangerous kind of oral erotics. Another theorist from the period, Arnulf, also uses this word, as he notes among the singers 
of, uh, among the most able kind of singers, a subgroup of female singers. And he says, this subgroup is, is so much the more precious, the more it is rare. For when she fee freely divides tones into semitones with a sweet-sounding throat, and divides semitones into indivisible microtones, she enjoys herself, and that's where the Laskivit word comes in, with an indescribable melody that you would rather deem angelic than human. And unsurprisingly, he then goes on to liken these women to earthly sirens who enchant the bewitched ears of their listeners and steal away their hearts, which are for the most part lulled by this kind of intoxication in secret theft. And having snatched them and made them subject to their will, they then enslave them and lead them, shipwrecked by the beauty, alas, of their prison, into an earthly charybdis in which no kind of redemption or ransom is available. This writer seems specifically to link the singing of small intervals, the atoms of pitch, with the beauty of these singers' song. And he then goes on to note the dangers of the song, causing the soporific intoxication of its listeners who love their subjection to the beauty of the prison as an earthly charybdis from which there's no escape. Arnolf's text testifies to the already mentioned underlying problem of the beauty of sound, the problem of the feminine. Music's linked to femininity, or at the very least, its ability to undermine typical Western constructions of self-willed active masculinity by making its listeners passive, soporific, and subject to the musical sound, seems to be at the root of the problem with the sound of beauty. These problems basically beset music throughout its history, from the Greeks to the present day, never winning the day, but always providing ammunition for those who found their own or others' subjection to beautiful sound somewhat distasteful, or who resented having their own emotions manipulated by a mere singer or player, or more latterly, by the disembodied sounds of electronic reproduction. And authorities continued to worry about the sirens. Later tonal music in the West famously extended this two-note chord sequence, this two-chord sequence that controlled time orally, figuring desire and resolution, to enormous temporal proportions in the music of the 19th century. Um, and this is sort of the classic instances, uh, Wagner's Tristan and Isolde, uh, in which there's a sort of very, very long cadence, like it gets pulled out into a long cadence, which seems to be happening over a very long period of time. And then at the moment where the lovers are separated, it doesn't get resolved. <laughs> um, and this actually might tell us, uh, explain at least in part, why in 1992, a report into church music commissioned by the archbishops of Canterbury and York condemned the music of Richard Wagner. <laughs> and there he is. So next time you go to a wedding, and remember that the tune properly known as Here Comes the Bride is probably frowned upon for inspiring lust, which may or may not be appropriate at a wedding. And uh, as I said at the opening here, this is uh, um, Mullah Omar. The Islamicist regime similarly view secular music, or indeed all music, uh, askance, with the Taliban in Afghanistan famously banning it entirely in the late 90s. Now, unlike many of my colleagues, I don't really see much change in the understanding of the sound of beauty during most of music history. If the voices of warning predominate at various periods, it's simply because the educated elites who voiced such warnings were more likely to be writing music theory or criticism, while those who have no such moral compunction were more likely to be playing, singing, and dancing. In all periods, it's possible to find those who extolled the joyful beauty of music, those who warned instead that a moral kind of sonic beauty was only assured within the correct regulatory framework, and those for whom most or nearly all music was simply immoral. In the 19th century, the apologists for music merely tried to ditch the category of beauty. They seemed to accept from its detractors that anything beautiful was therefore feminine, ornamental, and potentially immoral, and simply redefined beautiful sound as the sound of the sublime. So the sort of uh, approved aesthetic category shifted to the sublime, which was a much more reassuringly masculine, awesome, and even terrifying kind of oral pleasure that sought to evade the trivialization or immorality of beauty as a category. The elevation of difficult music, and ultimately in the 20th century of music that seemed to espouse a, a deliberate kind of ugliness, seemed responsibly and ethically to reflect the terrifying horrors of modernity. So, in summary, what have I been claiming today? In essence, I've looked at the twofold nature of the sound of beauty over the past two millennia of Western music history, 
with an emphasis uh, on the Middle Ages. Such beauty can serve as a sonic manifestation of a moral good, of the divine, of the music of the spheres, a glimpse into the mind of God. However, like most forms of beauty, it can serve a negative purpose, distracting and seducing, especially when corrupted by the venal mouths of human singers or divorced from a guiding text in wordless melismas or instrumental music. Like Odysseus, bound to the mast, wise men in the past sought to constrain their own musical practices by emphasizing music's rational content, tightly tying it with, to good words and insisting that its practice was strictly regulated. But music was too subtle, too beautiful, too irrational and irregular. The masculine sublime of modern music, by which I mean music written around, uh, uh, from about 1800, and the masculine rationality, rationality of earlier musical pedagogy are both equally attempts to remain in control while ceding control. After all, Odysseus managed this. He set up the control of himself, having himself tied to the masts, and cautioning the sailors to ignore any countermind, countermand while the sirens were singing. He was thus able to let go in safety. The Sound of Beauty tells us why music has the cultural importance it has, and why it has been and remains something over which people argue, legislate, and worry. Fundamentally, it brings us up against the compound nature of the human, the intersection of what Aristotle would call the animal soul and the rational soul, promising us something that only a rational human can attain, but ultimately showing us that we are also just animals. That this is troubling is not in doubt, but that is, it is also good to know and enjoyable is necessary. Whatever the music in question, and here I've limited myself to a rather high register Western European tradition of elite music making, just because that's what I'm most familiar with uh, and obviously from a research point of view most interested in, but whatever the music in question, its ability to merge the immiscible elements of being human makes it resemble nothing so much as human being itself. Thank you very much. you can but sympathize with St. August Augustine agonizing over how long a melisma should be before it becomes naughty. <laughs> <laughs> Leach has given us a, a wonderful account of the recur recurrent agonizing over the tension that music creates in people's, mostly men's, minds between the, the disciplined and the, and the dissolute. Um, Sorry, I won't tell you what I was going to say. Let me just end. <laughs> it wouldn't, wouldn't be appropriate in an adult audience. <laughs> but for a beautiful lecture, beautifully illustrated, and which we have both heard and have lived to remember, very many thanks. Thank you.